because I think this is what most users find easy. Uh, if you want to look at some history, uh, you can probably check like Delphi or Visual Basic, which have a component that you can drag, uh, just the same as we do with Node, that you can drag it into your canvas, and it, it's it's really strange because those are more visual, even more visual than Godot. But uh, you could so like drop a connection so into, the, into the thing you were making, yeah. and then you have like uh, the same talking. thing, like the yes. signals for when you get data it's and the notifications and everything. And I would think that this is probably this the easiest way to abstract a connection uh, for a user. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a virtual node, and then you you can inherit it like for TCP and UDP. Uh, this is the nice thing of like being object oriented in the engine. Uh, this is what I would probably do in that case for that specific use case of a connection. Uh, if the user wants to open a thread and do everything like I don't know, just something way more complex, I think it's fine to just use the the TCP or UDP resources or classes directly because. You expect something like that, but to make it easier for users, I think that would probably work better, in my opinion. Uh, then for multiplayer, I don't really know. I think what you did last time for multiplayer was really good. I, I'm not sure if you want to change that now or something like that, but uh, to me that was working pretty well in general. Yeah, yeah I think it uh, could still slightly be improved. Like my main use case is that actually most video games do not run the network uh, like at the same speed of yeah. the graphics. So they don't run uh, networking at 60 frames per second. And there are reasons for that, and uh, sometimes it's for algorithms behind it, like that for consensus right. between clients, or uh, it might be to limit the amount of data that is guaranteed to be transferred. So like right now, if you want, say, a 30 frames per second network tick, uh, yeah. No matter if you use the multiplayer API or raw TCP or whatever, you need to do threading yourself. And then when you pull the multiplayer API, you will get a, basically a message, like a, an, an event signal emitted inside the thread, which like might be problematic. And, yeah. and your function will be called out of sync, and you might even get crashes and things like that. So I think the main use case in, in the is like users wanting to make a game where the network tick is not the same as uh, physics or um, frame, and it's actually a specific number. Like they want that specific. Right. But one thing that comes to mind when you say that is that when you're working with networking, uh, usually I think the network tick in yeah, use case the usually the applies to UDP when you send like information all the time. Not so much to TCP. I mean, just for those who are not really uh, well versed in networking, uh, I will explain how usually games work. Uh, you have two kind of packets uh, when you send information to uh, uh, in a game to a server or between clients. Or you have like a what's called uh, safe and safe. I think there was a better way to say it. it was not safe. Uh, re reliable and unreliable. Unreliable. That's the usually the two ways you can send a package. What's the difference between reliable and unreliable? When you send like rela reliable, like TCP is reliable. Uh, when you send something that's reliable, you uh, you will make sure that like the networking system and every node in the in the middle of the internet between the two like connection peers uh, will make sure the package arrives. So for example, uh, you send a package and in the middle one of the middle computers that work like networking, like ISP or anything, like just lost the package. Uh, and then all the protocol or the TCP will make sure that the packet, the package is like re-requested back to the previous tones and then the packet will arrive definitely like, either as long as the connection doesn't like disconnect your package, your, your packet that you send from one computer to the other is always going to arrive, like it will always arrive. This usually uh, works, but has a problem that if the package packet didn't arrive, it needs to be re-requested. So usually when you have something that is very real time, I mean that something is happening here and you want to replicate it here, and there's a lot going on, usually you care more about like the, the, the you, you send packages all the time, but you're moving, your character is moving, and then it turns and goes for out, or, or you're making a driving game and you're just uh, turning to the left and to the right. You want to update the position all the time, right? Like, and if you're sending packets all the time, uh, the problem that you will have is that first that you will like, if he was talking about buffers, uh, you will like fill the buffer, okay. and maybe if there's a packet that didn't make it, it will be re-requested, but you don't really care anymore. If the packet didn't make it there, you just don't really care. Just wait, let the next one arrive, because by the time we re-requested the packet and everything, you, you wasted time. 
So usually when you're working real back, you're sending UDP packets, which are unreal, unreliable. The packet like may not send because of a network error or a bandwidth exceeded, but like, you send too many packets, so you, you drop some. Uh, but uh, what marks that you send them all the time. So uh, this is usually used for uh, real back connection. You send like a lot of uh, unreliable packets, and then some will get there, some will not get there. But you don't care because if one packet does get there, the next one is going to get the information you need, right? That's, yeah. But the more important is that you should, uh, the fact that we are sending, because we are sending it in quite uh, in a very quick way, one after one, right. you, but you should uh, use some uh, uh, some numbering inside to, because if some routing will reroute some of packets uh, by, by another word, you have ah, to yeah. reject the, the solution. Yeah, they arrive out of order. Yeah, usually so they, they, are, right. they need to arrive like in order because you may, for example, may you, you send two positions in time of a character, but the, you send this one and then you send a new one. But maybe the old one arrives before the, the, the new one. If you use GCP like reliable, everything arrives in order. Yeah, it's as you say. It's, if it's unreliable, it may arrive in. Usually, the networking in game engines they, takes care of this uh, below the surface, so you don't know what's going on. So the thing is, uh, I think what. So I, I will make an example. If you're like trying to transmit, transmit like imagine a game like uh, what was I don't know like Quake for example uh, uh, or Overwatch, more, more modern and like old. <laughs> so uh, all the character positions in a game like Overwatch are sent via unreliable packets like UDP because you send them all the time. And then if some packet was not, you don't care. The next one will contain information, or, or even if they are in order or not. But you just get information that it's like real-time information you're sending all the time. And this is sent like via unreliable packets. That just, you can lose packets, it's fine. But for example, imagine you kill somebody, you just shoot a person and that person died. Uh, that person, got, that, that packet need to be reliable because you definitely need to make sure that everyone recites the packet that this character had died. And then, like, he was killed. So this is like reliable. Usually, the game events are sent as reliable, and positioning or variables that are updated all the time are sent as unreliable. When we are discussing network ethics, which Fabio was saying, is usually how often you want to send the unreliable data, like all the position for all the characters moving around, or only if they move or something. So usually. What he says, I think, if I understand well, applies mostly to unreliable yeah. packets, not so but much to reliable packets. Uh, because reliable packets, you don't really send them all the time. You just send them when some something happens, like uh, you, uh, I don't know, you shoot something, uh, uh, or somebody died, like or something. You just send a reliable when like, <laughs> but something happens, not all the time, and re unreliable is for them. So if I understand right, what you mean is that you we should probably send send the unreliable packets at a lesser frame per second that. Uh, we do send uh, the um, like the physics for example. The physics process is at 60 times per second, and then the networking should probably send that less. Usually, what engines do is uh, you s you recite the packets as a less frame per second. Then like we interpolate between the old position and the new one. So maybe you probably have seen in some games that a character uh, another player like, is going there. And suddenly it goes back and goes somewhere else. Uh, this is very common in networking games. You try to avoid it, but it usually happens anyway. Uh, this is because uh, the the resolution when you send the the, um, the packets is lower than the actual gameplay. So it, well, if I understand well, so we we should probably you know you, we have in God you have like process which is for it's called every time a frame is wrong pretty much. We, you have the the physics process which is called. Every time there is a physics step, like in game engines, physics always needs to happen at, at a fixed time per second. So we could probably add a new one, like a network, network, network process, and make this scene only, because probably makes only sense to do it scene only. Uh, we could probably add an extra one, a scene process, and also call, call this as a something you talk about, configuring project settings. But I'm not sure if I would like need a network server for this. Probably it just can't go on the scene. It's like a, no. It can be done like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking because usually users, I mean, the servers are there, but most users don't even really use them. Uh, they usually, the reason you may want to use a server directly is, for example, this is something that needs to be more documented because a lot of 
users that really know it, but you can use all the scene and the notes and everything in the look and it's very easy, but you have the server APAs which are very low level, like if you want to manage, I don't know, 20,000 business objects with characters and, and things like that, you can just use the server API directly and it's way, way faster than using like the scene for this because the scene is going to take longer to load and longer to generate all the objects and everything. So if you want to have like dozens of thousands of, of things moving or doing things, you just can use the server API and it's way more efficient than using the scene. There's not much documentation this a lot of users try to use the scene and yeah. use a lot of instruction and go, hey, this is really slow and inefficient. And yeah, you can use servers directly for that. So I think servers are probably more for that, in my opinion. But I think what from what we got, we talk, we could use both the combination for. I mean, for I think it's two different things. Like for connection, like. Yeah. We could have like a connection node, I uh, don't know the name, mm -hmm. uh, which can have signals and everything, just like HTTP request. And I think you're right, we, we should probably have an extra process step for 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 networking, which is less, and you can configure it. That that's, would probably work, I think, without needing to make a server. But I mean, again, I don't bring in, uh, once you make a proposal, it will be easier to, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, but that's, 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 that's my, my point of, of view, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's actually been a very good discussion and um, yeah so just one more thing because uh, you have discussed very important thing because different devices you can make a clock ah. this is very important it's because uh, very good. there's a shift time for mm. example in RTP protocol is very very implemented with this uh, time shift between sender and receiver so when you uh, plan oh, yeah. it's very slow move. it's the white screen uh, is there. What to consider yeah, that, 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 uh, that, that you are calculating uh, do you should yeah, that's why uh, in put time on the speaker uh, and not on the each, screen. Uh, each yeah, from the standard and yeah. to the receiver because yeah, you can how calculate uh, uh, how much your clock you shifts against right. the sender clock. If you show so some you, because, uh, for example, um, some uh, games looking at the time stamps then it's very important because yeah. From, from the scoding uh, demos, after some of the time, readable on the screen, we don't see it. So you have to compensate uh, it against the screen, screen to avoid the 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 dropping the pixels from the receiver side. Uh, you yeah. Actually, I think you were working on that the past weeks. Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, I did work a little bit on clocks, uh, but not on the networking side, though. Um, so the, what I uh, see here, like, okay, it might be useful uh, in some cases, but it's still going to be uh, like eight bytes uh, on every packet, and on UDP that might be a problem. Like every byte counts, uh, and like most of the time you don't care about that value. Uh, most of the time, and also I I don't think it's very important to uh, calculate the shift between the two clocks. Like if you want to reorder, for example, packets you receive or drop packets that are out of order, uh, you don't really need to check the server clock against your clock. You just need to, like if the server on every things that want to be ordered uh, sends his own clock, and then in the client you keep track of the last received clock from the server, not your own clock. So no, they don't I, I, need to. I think I know why, why you mean that. I think you probably mean that in, in games that are like more deterministic, maybe, uh, where you don't really send the state, but more like the, the changes and the input. Uh, that probably makes a lot more sense. Uh, I, uh, let, let, me, let me explain that again so everyone understands. Uh, there's two ways of making a network game. One is like the real time game way, where you just like imagine a. An, a Usually, like a first-person shooter uses the real-time networking. Like every player sends the pos their position and their actions all the time to everyone, like as fast as possible, because uh, you really care about latency the most. Uh, but there are other, other, like for example, when you have a real-time strategy game, like if you're making a, a game with 10,000 units, maybe too much, 10,000, but maybe 1,000 units moving on the map. Sending the 1,000 units every time, every frame is going to be like really, really inefficient uh, because it's a lot to send for networking. Maybe we, you can like uh, make it a bit faster by only sending whatever each player sees everything. But usually that is not very efficient. Uh, when you're making a game based on uh, like usually it, this is usually made mostly for strategy games that, that it's used. That they are not completely real time. So what happens is that the game is, is simulated in two computers at the same time. Uh, and when you, what you send from one, one game to the other is just the input. Like, uh, when 
you you press like attack and then you make sure that both attack and the at frame like 59. Like, all, all the frames are synchronized be between two computers. They do exactly the same calculations. Uh, and when you attack, like you say, oh, I'm at frame like 159. Uh, and then you send a command to everyone. Like, okay, this player attack this position at player 159. And then this is synchronized. And if we all, if the clocks drift a bit within computers, then that can really kill your game because then the the, the difference between clocks is always a bit different between computer uh, with computers. And you always have the speed of light problem and everything. But but usually clocks can drift between two computers. So you need to make sure that they like uh, synchronize uh, all together. The problem with doing games that are like uh, deterministic, like strategy. strategy strategy games is that you can't use like floating point for them uh, because floating point can work different between like compilers or even CPU architectures. You can do just one calculation and the resulting number is can be different in two CPUs. So this is a big problem when doing like deterministic uh, physics or things like that. Uh, actually, when I was on GDC uh, this year, I met with Erwin Comans, who is the author of Bullet Physics Engine, and he was working on making a version of Bullet Deter Deterministic for making games of, of this kind. So this is a re very interesting problem, because you can only use integers if you want to make a game like this. You just can't use floats, because floats, like, again,